The Honourable Julia Gillard AC was Prime Minister of Australia from 2010 to 2013, becoming the first and only woman to ever do so. She rose through the ranks of the Labor Party to become the Deputy Prime Minister under Kevin Rudd and challenged his leadership, becoming Prime Minister in 2010. A subsequent challenge on her leadership meant she left politics in 2013 and has focused her attention to become an advocate for causes such as mental health, gender equality and education and is the chair of Beyond Blue Australia. And I am very, very excited that Julia Gillard is joining me today for the Value Creation Series. So let's get into it. Julia, how are you? I'm very well, thank you. I've got to say, I think you can hear my voice. I'm very excited. I'm a bit of a fan. <laughs> I have been for a long time. And I've got to ask you, 2020 has been a, a pretty crazy year. How are you doing? How are you? Uh, I'm, I'm doing fine. It has been a very, very different year for me. I normally travel extensively overseas. I've got commitments in London and the Global Partnership for Education, which I chair, takes me around the world. But instead, I've been in Adelaide. I've kind of been a day worker and a night worker to keep things going on global time zones. Mm -hmm. Often I'm working late into the night, but the technology has been incredible to keep us connected and working. And I'm really conscious I've done it a hell of a lot easier than so many other people, particularly people in Melbourne. I really struggled early on, to be honest. Like uh, I had a lot of things that, that got cancelled and you know, I was probably a bit stoic throughout it, like trying to act like I was okay when I actually wasn't. Did you, did you find like some real positive things come out of the time that you got to spend at home? Yeah, it's been a mix, you know. Uh, for me, being in the one place for so long, not travelling, sleeping in the same bed, all the rest of it. I think health-wise, it's mm. probably actually done me some good. Uh, but I've felt too that there's this sort of hum of anxiety in the background. You know, even if your world is kind of going okay, when it's as crazy as this right around the globe and you're watching the news reports, you can feel this sort of hum, this yep. static of anxiety behind you, what's going to happen next? So there have been moments when I've struggled with that and I've been really worried about family and friends and particularly friends overseas. So I'm at the stage now where I think roll on 2021, the vaccine, you know, I think that there's light at the end of this tunnel coming. You were the leader of this amazing country that we get to, to live in. Are you really proud of the way that Australians have come together to, to kind of overcome the, the struggles when you compare what we've done to the rest of the world? Oh, incredibly proud. I think when you put a crisis uh, on top of your underlying sort of societal structures, it shows the flaws. So if you've got a really unequal society, then that shows. If you've got a really unfair healthcare system, then that shows. And we should take a lot of pride in the fact that as Australians together, we've built a country that's not perfect, but in this crisis situation, people have known that they could get healthcare if they needed to. Uh, government systems have largely worked and made sure people are safe. Uh, the caring workforces, people who are essential workers have shown the courage to keep going and doing what they do and look after us all. So it's been a remarkable period. I think we've seen so much of the best in people. Couldn't agree more. Now, one of my favourite quotes from you is that if you're really passionate about something and you raise your voice, you can make a difference. You're someone who stands up for what you believe in and really backs yourself, which I love and I try and do for, for my community as well. Where did that ethos develop for you? I suppose it first developed uh, way back when, when I was a university student in Adelaide. So I finished um, high school in the late 1970s, <laughs> a long time ago, uh, and I went straight to university. You know, gap years weren't really a thing back then. And I was really uh, pleased and proud to be in university. That hadn't been, you know, part of my family background. Neither of my parents had, in fact, finished high school, but both of them were very aspirational for my sister and I. So I got to uni. I thought that was, you know, wonderful. I was going to study law. And then in the second year when I was there, there were some big government cutbacks to education. And I thought that was really wrong, you know, that university should be able to include people like me who came from mm -hmm. very ordinary backgrounds. And so that was the first time I sort of found a cause and then found a structure that enabled me to raise my voice. The student union was getting involved in a protest campaign, not just in Adelaide, but around the country. And I got swept up in that and the penny sort of dropped. Yes, you can make a difference. You know, you can find the people you want to work with, that you want to campaign with, and if you get really involved, then you can make change. And the government did change its mind on some of those cutbacks. Did you struggle with the, the confidence to stand up for what you believe in at an early age? Because I know I, 
I wanted to, but I, I felt like, you know, sometimes my voice might not have been heard and I was a bit timid to do so. And then as soon as I, I did, I'm, I'm glad that I did. Was there like a, was it an innate thing for you or do you think it was learnt to have that confidence to stand up? Oh, very much. Um, I learned it over time. I was actually a pretty shy kid. Mm. I wasn't the, you know, class spokesperson or the class clown or the one whose hand would go up first in, in class. Uh, in high school, I got persuaded to do high school debating by some friends of mine. I did debating as well. Yeah. What speaker were you? Uh, I was often number two, sometimes number three. Yeah, I was a third speaker. Uh, and we were an all-girl team. Not, yeah. I mean, I went to a co-ed school, but it was just, you know, the girls said, we'll do it. Uh, and we, I remember we got forced uh, to debate the proposition that the man should lead and to argue the pro of that oh, no proposition. <laughs> so that was pretty hard. Um, but I found a little bit more confidence through that. I was a high school prefect, and so that meant you used to go and speak to the younger kids, the junior classes, so I got a bit of confidence there. But really found it through this campaigning. I wasn't the one who would rush into a meeting and say, I know what we should do. I'd hang back and watch and learn. And then as I got more and more confident, then I would start to speak. And the more I did it, I think I got better at it. Uh, so for me, it wasn't innate. It was something that I just developed over time through being involved. Yeah, I think it's important to talk about that because people might see yourself or even myself and think that it just happens. But it's actually, you learn it over time and you work hard on it. What What's the trigger for you that decides that when you decide that you're going to be motivated to stick up for a cause and try and have an impact on something? I think it's got to be a combination of heart and head. Mm. You know, the, uh, the things that you're most passionate about are the things that just resonate with you deeply, either because of your own lived experience or perhaps something that you've seen through uh, friends and family, but something that really strikes you as core to you and your set of beliefs. So educational opportunity has always been one of those big things for me. You know, my parents, very intelligent people, just poverty and other circumstances meant they didn't get to finish school, they didn't get to, you know, go to post-school education. Their lives could have been quite different if they'd had that access. And then of the head, you've got to know that uh, there are things that you, you want to campaign for or you want to speak about that will make a difference. So it's not just being able to say, I want education to be better. You've got to be able to answer the question of how, how do you want it to be better? And that's where your sort of intelligence and your study and your looking at things and thinking things through comes in. Now, due to your incredible works in politics, you live a life in the limelight, you have for the last few decades. Is there any misconceptions that people have about you that you often see? And laugh about or what makes you sad? Oh, well, I think my classic uh, opening uh, conversation with people uh, when they meet me for the first time is generally, you're so much smaller than I thought you would be. <laughs> uh, and I think it's because, you know, you're, the impression of me they formed is at the dispatch box, you know, there's nothing alongside you that gives a sense of height. Um, and you know, you're animated perhaps with your voice raised. Yeah. So they're expecting this kind of six foot 10 shouting <laughs> ogre. And when you get there and you're kind of more mild mannered and you're a lot smaller, people are like, wow, yeah. I thought you'd be really different. They don't have that misconception about me. Luckily in the chair, I'm always short, which is good, <laughs> works for me. Now your um, father was a psychiatric nurse. What insights did that give you into the space of mental health? Because you're a keen advocate in that now. Well, it gave me an insight in the sense of you know, caring, how much it takes for people who are caring and concerned about people with mental illness, particularly at the acute end. So my father, you know, not when my sister and I were really, really young, but as we got older, my father would come home, he'd talk about uh, suicide because people that he had uh, worked with um, ended up uh, taking their own lives. Uh, he'd talk about people who had, uh, you know, post-traumatic stress disorders. Uh, he used to care for people who still had some of those outworkings from World War II, from being mm -hmm. involved in combat in World War II. So it gave me a sense of the diversity of mental health conditions and what it takes to care. 
But it also gave me a sense of how the system was changing. You know, when my dad was first a nurse, it was incredibly regulated, regimented. Even as a nurse, he'd wear a suit to work. The colour of his tie would designate what level mental health nurse he was. By the time he left all those years later, he'd wear a pair of jeans and a T-shirt. You'd go to pick him up. You'd look round the room. You wouldn't be able to tell from what people were wearing, who was a doctor, who was a nurse, who was there as a patient. You know, the whole thing was getting on that wave that ultimately led to de institutionalisation. So I had a sense of the changing policy perspectives too. What about the stigma around mental health? You're the chair of Beyond Blue Australia. And I'm going to be up front. I used to get bullied about my disability as a kid and um, I had a really tough two years. Like I didn't leave the house. I played video games, put on a lot of weight and um, I didn't tell anyone about it at the time because I was really embarrassed about it, how I was feeling. Do you think that, do you think that stigma is changing now um, by you know, not only in this country, but all around the world? Oh, yes, I do. I think the stigma is changing. I mean, when I was, you know, growing up, you'd, you know, be in your new class at school and, you know, what, is, what does your dad do? Oh, my dad's a psychiatric nurse. People are like, oh, that's a yeah. kind of a bit odd, you know. And, and people wouldn't, you know, they wouldn't talk about their own mental health. They wouldn't talk about things in their family. It was very common back then if a family member had suicided for the family to come up with a cover story. They would pretend that they'd died in an accident or something like that because it was viewed as a shameful thing to talk mm. about and we're not where we need to be but we are a world away from that and my sense now is people are much more open about mental health the fact that every day of the pandemic uh, as we've talked about the physical health crisis people have also talked about mental health yep. and the burdens of lockdown I think shows that but there's still some stigma. It's one thing to say, oh look, you know, if you told me you had a mental health condition, we could have a conversation about that. It's another thing for people to say, and I'd be happy to employ someone give who said that, give them a promotion. Agreed. I'd be happy if the person next to me in my work team yep. said that to me. Um, you know, that would be fine by me. I think we've still got some of that to deal with. And I think we've still got self-stigma to deal with. So it's, you know, people who, hold themselves back because they're fearful of the reaction of others. Now you've been in some, if not the highest pressure job in this country, one of around the world. How do you look after your mental health? Have you had mental health struggles yourself or what do you do to look after yourself? Yeah, I, I wouldn't say I've had struggles, um, but like everybody, I've had, you know, cycles of up and down. And I did have to think when I was in that really high pressured environment, you know, what do I need to do to kind of yeah. keep myself going? I think, you know, being involved in Beyond Blue now, I probably learned some language around this that I didn't quite know yeah. then. But I did think, you know, this is, this is a marathon, not a sprint. You can burn out. Uh, you can get to a stage where you're not functioning well. You know, what do I need to do to make sure I can keep going? And so I did used to think about, um, you know, making sure I got some sleep, making sure I got some relief, some um, times when I wasn't looking at my phone, when I wasn't doing paperwork, where I just let myself be, um, you know, that I kept in good touch with family and friends because of the, you know, benefits that come with dealing with people who have known you for a long time, so they're not reacting to Julia Gillard, Prime Minister, yeah. you're just the Julia that you were 20 years ago, 30 years ago. So all of that was really important to me. Yeah, I love that. And you know, I, I play tennis sometimes and uh, I see a psychologist and I say, I'm seeing a psychologist and people go, what's wrong? And I go, well, I go to the gym, right, to look after my physical fitness. Why would I not try and be as strong as I can be mentally, not only on the tennis court, but, but as a person? Is, is that something that Beyond Blue also really advocates for, is like getting, getting the help when you need it? Oh yes, we, we do. I mean, we imagine the whole system as a kind of traffic-like system. You know, we use that terminology with people. We say, you know, when you're in the green, things are good, you're coping with the stresses yep. in your life, you're sleeping well, you know, everything's fine. You know, in the amber, you're feeling pressurised, maybe your sleep's getting a bit disrupted, you're not feeling yourself. Um, into the red, where you're really in some form of crisis. And we talk to people about the strategies in each of those zones. 
And even when you're in the green, think about how you're going to keep yourself yeah. in the green. Don't just roll until you're in the amber. And then if you're in the amber, uh, certainly reach out. And we talk about stepped care. You know, not everybody needs to see a doctor, a psychologist, a psychiatrist. Um, people can get low intensity options. We've got a thing called new access where you see a coach. Cool. Um, and that can be enough for yep. people to get back in the green. If it's not, then you can step it up and step it up into the more you know, clinical and heavy duty end. Now, from my community, young people with disabilities, you know, I struggle with my mental health, as I said, and Beyond Blue's done some, some uh, surveys and research around that, that young people with disability face bigger mental health hurdles than, than able-bodied kids. Do you know what are the steps Beyond Blue and people are taking to try and help that, you know, that my community? Yeah, we um, have uh, BU, which is our program um, in schools to help with mental health issue in, issues in schools and resilience and combating bullying and uh, helping kids develop a good, healthy sense of who they are and how to relate to the world. And of course, you know, children with disabilities obviously have got uh, a set of issues, but you know, many young people struggle with um, images about their own body, about their own acceptability, about whether or not they are going to have friends. You know, lots of mm. kids who, you know, lots of girls uh, when I was growing up would struggle constantly with the, am I thin enough? Am I pretty enough? You know, all of those, yeah. uh, particularly as your body's changing as a teenager. And social media not helping, that's the thing. Yeah, days. and and you know, in my day, your comparison was perhaps with the prettiest girl in your class yeah. or in the school. Not a now model in anywhere. Yeah, exactly. now, now right. your comparisons with all these in influencers <laughs> who are in these carefully curated photos yeah. so that they always look amazing. Um, and that's not real life. So we're trying to deal with that right at that generation end in school. And, you know, for us, the most authentic, creative voices always come from those with lived experiences. Yeah. You know, I don't know what it's like to be you, you don't know what it's like to be me. And so we've got to, we've got to draw on that lived experience um, from communities that can tell us, look, this is the best way to intersect with my community. Yeah, I like to say, if you want to speak about somebody at a table, they need a seat at that table because they know best. And it leads me on to something that I'm obviously really passionate about. And one reason that I love you, I'm going to be upfront about it, was the, the work around the NDIS. And I get emotional thinking about it because I remember where I was when the NDIS bill was introduced into parliament. And I actually went back and listened to you introduce that bill and you got really emotional about it, right? And it gives me little goosebumps when I think about it because it's changed yeah. my life, my friend's life, so many people that I know. Why did you get emo emotional that day when, when you were putting that bill into, par into Parliament for the first yeah, time? Yeah, I, I remember that day really clearly and I in part remember it because uh, Wayne Swan was sitting behind me, the Deputy Prime Minister, and I did get emotional. And when I sat down, Wayne said to me, oh, I would have backed it in that Macklin was the one who was going to cry. <laughs> <There you go. laughs> because uh, Jenny, uh, you know, she's a wonderful woman, a caring woman, but uh, with a reputation of much more likely to get emotional yeah. than me. Uh, so, you know, Wayne, that was a very humorous, dry humour moment. We'd worked so hard and, and I feel like this was a almost endless baton relay and we had the baton for the last bit. Mm -hmm. uh, but the, the race had actually started, you know, way back in the 1970s when the uh, disability community was saying there's got to be a better way of doing this, an insurance scheme, using insurance principles, giving people choice and options for their care, putting them right at the centre of making decisions about their lives. That's what we need to do. And, you know, people pushed that case the 70s, the 80s, the 90s, on and on it went. And the, the you know, every Australian Counts campaign was then bringing it to the fore again. And we were able to carry the baton that last bit and get it done. And so I was really conscious of the privilege of being there at that moment after all of that campaigning, finally being able to say, it's here, it's mm. going to happen. Now, how does, how does it make you feel when, you know, you were a part of something that was so big for, for so many Australians, 4.5 million Aussies with a disability, nearly 500,000 of them on the NDIS. You know, there was young kids, 16 year old kids in nursing homes with 80 year old people. There were people who couldn't get care, couldn't travel, couldn't do anything. How does that make you feel when you see those people with disability getting out and living the lives that they deserve to live, knowing that you played a, 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 you know, a big role in that? 
Yeah, look, of the, of the people who, you know, rush up to me to tell me a story now when I'm moving around Australia, the two big categories would be people who rush up to tell me about the NDIS Good. and people who uh, rush up to talk to me about uh, the Royal Commission into Child Sexual Abuse and maybe their own experiences or experiences in their family. Mm -hmm. And it reinforces for me that, you know, when we th say government, parliament, you know, people think, oh, it's all these big kind of machinery things, you know, big government departments that do things and, you know, Medicare and big institutions. Um, but yes, it is all of that, but all of that is for a purpose and the purpose is about people. Mm -hmm. And the measure of anything that government does is whether it has enabled positive change in the lived experience of Australians and you know I feel so heartened when I hear those stories from people because it just reminds that yes we played our part uh, working alongside so many others and you know change is possible I think there's a lot of cynicism around in the modern age and I'd invite people to just reflect on you know good things can happen if we actually decide we're going to do them together. I love hearing that. Now the Prime Minister's got to be one of the toughest gigs you know, all around the world, intensified by the fact that you were the first female PM to do so. Uh, there was attacks by the media, you know, all kinds of different people, yet the people that are really close to you say that you always had time for everybody. I can see that you do right now. How, how did you have that res internal resilience when you, know, you were getting painted a certain way in the media when you knew that picture wasn't actually true to the person that you were? Yeah, I think there's sort of a few long-standing factors and a few tricks that I, I learned and used. I mean, the long-standing factors, I've always been a pretty calm person. Um, you know, that's my you know genuine demeanour. I'm not someone who gets easily head up. <laughs> um, uh, and I think that stood me in good stead. Um, I think uh, I've thought all across my life, and I certainly uh, was taught this in my family home, that the measure of a person is not how they treat, you know, people that they view as above them in the hierarchy, that the measure of a person is how they treat everyone. Um, and I, I genuinely think if you want to know someone, you know, watch how they interact with the, you know, waiter who's bringing a coffee or the, you know, person at the counter when they're trying to buy something in a shop, that'll tell you more about them than almost anything else. And so I've always, you know, wanted, I'm not perfect by any stretch of the imagination, but I've always wanted to, um, you know, be decent with people as I deal with them. And then in terms of the tricks, um, I ended up almost thinking about Julia Gillard, the politician in the third person, you know, because it is, it's your public persona that's under complete criticism and you've got to think about that as a political problem, but you can't really let it get inside here. Yep. You've got to keep that separation. I say the same thing, I've got a mindset coach, a guy called Ben Crow, and he says that deal on the person is different from deal on the persona. And you're right, people might look at, say me, and write something discriminatory on, about me on Twitter, and I get so, used to get sad about it. And they're like, they don't know you, you know what I mean? So I think that separation is important. Um, now in 2012, you gave, easily one of the best speeches ever in, in question time. Impactful, powerful, unforgettable. Why did you make, what, what was the lead up to that and why did you pick that moment to, to, to make that speech? Well, sort of the moment picked me rather yeah. than the other way around. So, uh, you know, we have question time in Parliament every day, so it's the, you know, real joust of the day. And I had expected that day that it would be around sexism uh, because the speaker that I'd supported in the House of Representatives had been unmasked as having sent some sexist text messages, mm -hmm. very sexist ones. And I thought the opposition would be using question time to say, you're such a hypocrite, you should never have supported him to be speaker. Now, the fact that I couldn't have ever known about those text yeah. messages at the time, you know, it's never let the truth get in the way of a good combative question yeah. time. So I wasn't, uh, you know, I, I thought all of this will be happening. So I went in ready for that. Um, but to my surprise, instead of having question time, the leader of the opposition, Tony Abbott, moved a motion. And so the speech that's come to be known as the misogyny yeah. speech is the one in reply. So, you know, I didn't know I'd be giving it until I was giving it. You were on a roll when you started. Did you did you go in knowing that that speech was going to be, you know, so powerful, or did you feel it when you were in there and, and felt the moment to do it? 
I, I, I certainly had no sense that, um, you know, we'd be talking about it all these years later, no yeah. sense whatsoever. Uh, I knew that the moment, the parliamentary moment, called for me to deliver a hard-hitting speech. And, you know, you do feel the sense of adrenaline and energy in, in question time. I felt that. Yeah, you can see that. Yeah, I loved it. <laughs> uh, and I felt, um, you know, I felt right to go. I mean, some, some days uh, in that sort of very um, intense, combative arena, you didn't feel quite right to go. But I felt right to go that day. Um, but, yeah, no sense. You know, I knew as I was giving it, it was a landing you know, as a powerful speech in the parliament, but I didn't have any sense that it would land the way it has outside. And I've got to ask, what does it mean to you to be a TikTok superstar? <laughs> that is, do you know that was the number one video in Australia on TikTok, people using your speech to mime? It's, and it's probably some of the people doing those videos would have been 10, year, 10 years old during that speech. What does it mean that you're actually, they're seeing that and influencing it and using it and, and it's like, you know, having an impact on their lives as well? Well, I think the whole thing is showing age ranges and generations because yes, there would have been some uh, people who were 10 years old. At my end of the spectrum, uh, a friend texted me and said, you know, you're running big on TikTok. <laughs> I'm like, okay, I better work out what TikTok is. Exactly. So um, I didn't know what TikTok was before that. Uh, and when I finally worked all of that out, uh, I was, look, I'm, I'm really glad that that speech has come to mean something for uh, young people, young women in particular, that it's become a bit of a battle anthem for them. I'm very proud of that. Good. I love it too. I'm going to have a crack at it actually. Uh, now, you recently co-authored a book, uh, Women in Leadership. Uh, there was key themes and takeaways from Jacinda Ardern, Hillary Clinton, Theresa May. Can you tell us a bit about um, the making of that book? Yeah, I co-authored it with a great friend of mine, a Nigerian woman called Ngozi Okonjiri Wheeler. She was the first woman to become uh, for Foreign Minister of Nigeria, Finance Minister of Nigeria, and she's now just, just been appointed as the first woman to lead the World Trade Organisation, which of course we've been hearing so much about in Australia as we talk about trade issues. And we sort of came together and we were having conversations about what's happening with women leaders around the world. Why aren't there more of them? Why every time we look at coverage about them does there seem to be these clear gendered themes? And so we set out to try and solve that problem by interviewing eight of the leading female politicians around the world and looking at the research on gender and leadership. And we wanted the book to speak to everyone. Yes, we talked to politicians, but we wanted it to speak more broadly than the world of politics. And we wanted it to be a sort of how-to guide for women who are aspiring. But we also wanted it to be a, a lesson for all of us about what we can do in our own way in the environments that we move in to make them more gender equal environments. So it was a passion project and it's books now on sale in many parts around the world. And it's getting, a great lineup. Yeah, yeah, getting good, good feedback. Good. Yeah. And uh, look, I got to, I mean, I obviously knew a number of the women like Jacinda, uh, but I got to meet some extraordinary women doing the interviews too. When you see people like Jacinda Ardern and how well she's doing and, and how well New Zealand's doing as a leader, um, how does it make you feel seeing that, I mean, it, it hasn't happened quick enough, but there are slowly more women in leadership roles, you know, um, what, what needs to happen to, to fasten that process so there are, there are more, more women getting opportunities they deserve? Well, I think uh, for Aussies, there's something really to think about when we look across at New Zealand. I mean, they are on their third female Prime Minister, yeah. one of two nations on earth to have had three women, Iceland's the other one, we've had one. And the World Economic Forum puts out rankings each year of gender equality, and New Zealand gives us a bath. You yeah. know, they come so much higher than us in the top 10 they in the world. They give us a bath in a lot, a lot of things. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, in the sporting contest, everybody's like, yeah, we want to yeah. we, we win that. Well, I want us to have the same sense of motivation around this gender equality contest. We should want to win that. We Bloody should want to be better than New Zealand. <laughs> so, you know, there are things we can learn from them. Uh, you know, to enable more women to come through, it's a, it's a complex question, but political parties have to do the right thing, uh, pre-select more women, involve more women in their operations. Uh, Labor has done a lot of that, but, you know, on the other side of politics, more needs to be done. Um, the media has to treat women equally, not report mm -hmm. what they're wearing, what they look like, their family structures, report them as politicians mm -hmm. and leaders. 
Uh, there are things to think about in the parliamentary environment. How easy or hard do we make it, particularly for women who are in the family formation stage, having kids? You know, many layers of this to think through. And we've done some things, but there's much more to do. Yeah. Uh, I love, read your book, and I love one of the chapters that you titled She's a Bit of a Bitch, uh, calling out the psychology and the unconscious bias that, that women face. Uh, do, do you think that, that the... I mean, the uphill battle is going to be there for, for a while, but do you think talking about stories like this is the best way to get that, that change in our culture? I do. I think the, the visibility of the psychological research really matters. And you know, to give a real world example of that, you know, in 2016, uh, a big problem for Hillary Clinton was that people viewed her as unlikable. Yep. And there was good psychological research that said people are predisposed to view that view women who are ambitious and seeking power as unlikable but they don't put the same burden on the shoulders of ambitious men seeking power so they're actually wired to think men who are go-getters are probably pretty likable and women who are go-getters are probably a bit of a bitch but when Hillary was running for the election people were just talking about she's unlikable they weren't talking about this gender analysis if we fast forward the clock to 2020 uh, with uh, Kamala Harris as the vice presidential candidate, the minute Donald Trump said, no one likes her, she's mean, she's nasty, people were in the media saying that's a gendered stereotype that he's using. He's only saying that because she's a woman. Mm. So, and that changed the debate around her as a political candidate, that the psychological research got the light shone on it. So that's really important for us to be surfacing this unconscious bias we have in our heads about women leaders. And if you shine a light on it, then it won't, it'll disappear. You know, these biases never survive if they're taken from the shadows into the light. Yeah. I mean, you're such a pillar of hope and, and a leader for, for women, especially in this country. I told my partner Chantel, we were having a chat today, my brother's girlfriend Anne, my mum, and everyone's like, Julia Gillard, I love yeah. Julia Gillard. <laughs> How does that make you feel? That, that so many you know, women in this country look up to, to not only what, what you did becoming the first Prime Minister, but what you're doing now in, in all the work that you're doing as an advocate. It's lovely, obviously, and to feel uh, supported by people. It's very important to me, but uh, you know, more than that, it's important to feel that the causes that I'm dedicating my time to are ones that people are prepared to mobilise for and support. So I'm very much involved, obviously, beyond blue, mental health, very much involved with education, particularly girls' education, uh, very much involved with women's leadership. So it's great if people get intrigued about those things um, and want to lean into them. Now, you've had a lot of tough, tough fights in your political career. Um, what, what was one of the toughest moments that, that you had and, and how did you overcome that? Yeah, I mean, the whole struggle about carbon pricing and creating an emissions trading scheme, the, you know, ditch the witch stuff mm. that all started around that and many other gendered stereotypes, um, that was tough. And, you know, finally bringing that reform to the nation only to see it swept away when the cycle of politics changed and a Conservative government was elected. Um, that, that was hard. It was, you know, sort of a corrosive thing, you know, day after day to be in the middle of this very high fevered and in many ways irrational debate. What I'm hopeful looking back now is that we made some space for people to see, yes, there was a solution that worked. It was reducing um, our degree of carbon pollution. And when we get to the stage as a nation that we're going to make a new choice, about how to deal with climate change better, we can look back and say, yeah, there was something that worked and we can bring something forward uh, having had that experience. Now, this is all about uh, creating value. There's a lot of business leaders and things like that who will watch this. What's the, uh, I think, the most critical change in mindset that you think that has to happen in this country, not only in government, but, but also in corporate Australia as well? I think uh, government, corporate Australia, we've been operating for many years now on a set of assumptions about what the world's going to be like. And even before COVID, I think those assumptions were giving way. And now post the pandemic, I think many of them will give way entirely. We are heading towards a very different future mm -hmm. than the one we expected. And so I think agility in, in your mind, not, you know, 
believing that you've always got something to learn, that there's always something new, that you've got to be you know, trying to work out how to peek around corners, what's going to happen next, not getting ossified in this is always the right way of doing things or this is always the you know, structures and constraints that are going to be in our society. I think there's so much change that keeping that mental agility is something to put at the forefront. Couldn't agree more. And if we fast forward 10 years and there's a, a female politician, prime minister, leader, what do you think the world has to look like to be able to support that person so they can you know, be the best that they can be? I think doing uh, what we're doing now, but doing it quicker. Yeah. Um, so we're, we're, you know, so many people are interested, predisposed, positive about a more gender equal world. So many young women and young men are basically saying, we don't want to live with these stereotypes that have been created for us. We want to be the architects of our own life journey. So don't tell me that I've got to do this or got to do that just because I'm a man or just because I'm a woman. Uh, I think all of that is changing, but for genuine equality, we've got to fast forward that clock. And are you, are you enjoying your life post-political work? Are you, uh, are you happy? Uh, I mean, what, what's next for you? Yeah, I'm very much enjoying my life. I had to, um, I had to create a, a barrier for myself. You know, uh, what's, what's done is done. Uh, and you can learn from it, you can take things with you, but I decided from the moment I exited politics, uh, I'm going to write a book about my experiences, which I did, my story, and once that was done, I wasn't going to obsess about the past, I was going to look to the future, and that's made a very big difference for me and how I feel and the things that I do and whether I feel healthy and content in my life. And so the big pieces for me uh, in the future are Beyond Blue, continuing that, uh, continuing my work on women's leadership at the Global Institute for Women's Leadership, which will be both London and at the Australian National U University here in Australia. Focusing still on girls' education. And then I've got a new challenge I'm taking up next year, chairing the Wellcome Trust, uh, which is a huge philanthropic fund that invests in health and medical research. And haven't we learned a lot about the importance Bloody of that yeah. in 2020? We, we definitely have. Last question, Julia. What would be one bit of advice you would give to younger Julia Gillard, a young woman who was trying to come up and, and, and get in the position that you, that you did? The best bit of advice I would give is uh, be clear about your sense of purpose, what you're doing it for, because that will sustain you. And if I could sneak in one other bit of advice. You can have as many as you want, all right. <laughs> for, young, <laughs> for young women who are coming up now, you know, they've kind of had the benefit of watching this movie before. You know, they've seen uh, me and other female leaders here and around the world uh, learn what you can about the gendered experiences because forewarned is forearmed. Julia Gillard, you're a superstar. I really enjoyed Thank this. You. I wish we were allowed a hug. I know we're not allowed to at the moment. I want to give you a big hug. I really appreciate you being we'll do so... do the virtual we'll hug. do a virtual hug. Right? Uh, I just can't thank you enough for being so uh, happy and, and honest and, and I really appreciate it. And uh, yeah, it was a great opportunity for, for me. I've always wanted to have a sit down and have a chat to you. So thank you so much for joining the Value Creation Series. And when we can hug, when we're allowed to, can we do that in like a few months? Is that Absolutely, we can. And th hey. thank you for having me on. This is on Phil, all right? So I get, I get that coffee and a hug. Julia, thank you. Thank you.